Welcome to the public safety meeting of the City Council. And I will be chairing this meeting. I'm City Councilor Maureen Carney. With me is City Councilor David Murphy and our, our administrative assistant, uh, Pam. And uh, we have a presentation this evening from the fire department. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Chief Nichols. Thank you. So just, just kind of a, a quick, I, I'd say a quick update, but just to kind of give you up to speed. Uh, since I was promoted in July, to kind of, I think, keep you guys informed of what's going on and, and happenings in the department and some of the things that we have going on up through there. Uh, in July, when I took over, uh, I was tasked with doing two promotional tests where we had a number of vacancies in our, in our offices. I know Councilor Murphy uh, graciously helped us out with, with a couple of those. And uh, so we got those done, and uh, we hence had some recent promotions out through there. I'd, I'd like to introduce, uh, I think everyone knows, my new assistant chief, John Davin. Uh, and uh, my <coughs> new EMS deputy, which is John Carey. Uh, so those were two of the promotions that we had out there. And then we ended up promoting uh, a couple of captains, uh, Mike Hatch and David Moret, to fill some vacancies from there, one to retirement and one because of Chief Duggan. And uh, we were actually poised pretty well for at least the short term with a current promotional list on the captains and the deputy chiefs. So those were coming, some of the happenings and kind of the recent things that had to uh, get done before you know we can get the department back up to speed. Uh, budget wise we're doing pretty well. Uh, just to give you guys a quick update, we have two personnel that are out on long term leave. Uh, one's an IOD, uh, it's a knee injury that occurred in a fire, and the other one's uh, a sick leave status that uh, I'm hoping that he may return this month and we'll be back from there. Uh, we currently have two vacancies uh, that we're trying to fill and uh, we're actually working with HR to try to get those uh, accomplished we did one round of interviews and we're moving forward uh, as quickly as we can to keep going in the future uh, and just to give everyone an update there we're anticipating at least two more retirements in january as we go forward so uh, we're, we're trying to build up that pool of people so we can you know fill pretty quickly as people leave uh, out through there uh, just let you know our capital plan was submitted i know we'll meet with we'll see you uh, tomorrow uh, Wednesday. 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 So we'll, we'll see that there. Uh, just some of the uh, FY15 capital projects that we're, we're kind of finishing up on. It was we had some money to uh, upgrade our SCBA, our self contained breathing apparatus, and we're, we're currently uh, just finishing up the paperwork to get that done. Uh, we got money for a new command vehicle uh, for the department, and we're finishing that up, and, uh, and we're still actually working on a new ambulance. Uh, as you guys know, I think that the ambulance has come out of the capital planning process and is put into the regular budget and I'm moving forward in that, in that manner. So uh, I think that's a great way to keep us up to date on ambulances and current rotations out there. Uh, just to give you a, a quick update on a few things, some new initiatives that since I've taken over as chief that we've really tried to move along and, and I feel strongly about uh, and is public education. I think one of the things that we could do better, and I'm hoping we can do better in the city, is get out and reach to the community as far as public education and, and fire protection. And we have firefighter Stoll Minor just going to do a quick presentation on that in a little bit here. Uh, a couple other initiatives that I really felt strongly about was certainly our employee health and wellness. Uh, we, we currently have a, a member from the gym next door coming over doing just a quick presentation to our department members over exercising and you know the benefits of uh, you know working out and taking care of yourself and we're looking at a few other uh, initiatives out there i've talked to chief casper in the police department and she's interested in kind of you know working together on this as we go forward and uh, and then the other thing that we've done is uh, certainly looked at training and uh, we felt strongly about uh, you know moving people forward and giving them the professional development that needed to develop that professional workforce out there you must have a pretty young department budget. Uh, we, we do. Uh, I mean, we, we have a lot look, of... I'm people. getting older, and they look younger to me. They, 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 <laughs> they do look younger. Uh, you, you, I mean, I think you do, but yep. a lot of the old-time guys are... Yeah, we, we're losing that. I mean, in January, we got two retirements. Uh, Deputy Chief Gagney's going to retire, and uh, Mark McCormick, a firefighter. Uh, they'll be moving, moving on to retirement there. And, uh, every year goes by, I feel a little bit older as we go. But we do have a lot of a good group of young people in there, and uh, you know, it's, it's 
neat to work with them and, and see the enthusiasm and uh, the energy that they have as we go forward. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Assistant Chief Davin just to talk about some of the operational things uh, that we have going on in the department. And uh, I'll let him. Sure. Thanks, Chief. Uh, one of our major operations is um, our current rescue truck is uh, early, is a late 1980s rescue truck. We're in the process of replacing that. Our new one has uh, been built by Pierce Fire Apparatus. We brought a picture of it. Um, it should be, we should be taking delivery within the next couple weeks. So we'll be replacing our old one, and that'll be our new rescue truck. It needs to come up to uh, Massachusetts, get lettered, and then once we get it, you know, we'll put our equipment on it, and we've gotten rid of our old one. So they're going to take that and sell it for us. We bought some new equipment also to put on the new rescue, so we're, we're excited about that. We had a, a really strong committee. I think the firefighters have built a rescue that is within budget and it's it's practical. Uh, we've made it so that we can put a hitch on it and tow our boat, our hazmat trailer. Uh, we've got backup cameras on it, um, a lot of lighting. You know, we get a lot of calls for accidents where we, we need to light up the scene and stuff. So we, I think we've done. A really good job of that so we're looking forward to grabbing that in a couple weeks uh, the chief spoke about some training initiatives um, all of our deputy chiefs now including the ones that will be promoted in the future are now trained to the highest incident command level which is ICS 400 so a couple of them just finished that uh, the last couple of months um, also we're looking at next year a new station alerting system which is the, the system that turns on the lights and alerts us for calls the current station learning system is uh, original to the building, yep. to the headquarters. So that was 1999. Uh, we're having some problems with it. And it, you know, a lot of the problems, it, it just it's aging infrastructure. And we currently use uh, Verizon phone lines. So the phone lines go out to the Florence station, and that's where we have most of our problems. Uh, you know, the calls aren't getting out there, the tones aren't coming on, the lights aren't turning on. And we trace that problem back to Verizon. And this new system that we're looking at is built by Purvis. It's an automated system, so it has a computer-aided uh, dispatch voice. And this system will run, the city has installed fiber into all the city buildings. So this new system, instead of paying Verizon monthly for their service and the copper backup service that we have to pay for, we can tie into the city fiber. So uh, we're looking at a, a, a cost savings there. And also currently with our new, with our station learning system now, the way it works when a call comes in, every light in the state, in both stations turns on and they're fluorescent lights. They turn on and they stay on for four minutes. Now we average 22, 23 calls a day. So they're turning on that many times a day and we go through a lot of light bulbs. So this new system will actually be the small LED lights that are gonna be mounted right on the speakers of the ceiling. So they're brighter, they use less energy, and we're not gonna be walking around and replacing light bulbs mm -hmm. every day. We, we go through a lot of light bulbs. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at a cost savings there. It's uh, the, we'd be one of the first departments, actually the only two I know of right now are Boston and Foxborough that use an automated dispatch system. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, we've got a committee working on that. We've got firefighters, uh, somebody from dispatch, and myself. So. We've narrowed it down to one company, and we're just working on the specifics right now. What, what backs that up? Because that's going out on, on the loop. But what I know, like Verizon, it goes out on copper, and it goes out. On, and you must have a T1 from them or something. Right? Yes. yes. So it goes out of T1, it goes out of copper. Yeah. What backs up the city loop? Because that would be vulnerable to the same stuff that you know, the yeah, Verizon you're talking T1. as far as the, the, the fiber optic? Yeah, because you, yeah, because that, I we mean, have that's the copper on. lines, the copper are, are, are going to stay? Lines. Yes. Okay, yeah. so you'd be on, yeah. rather than Verizon, you'd be on the city loop. City and, loop, and we have the copper And the back, copper back up, copper back. like, just like you do now. And then the dispatch center can always override the system, and we can just use our radios. They can dispatch over our mobile and portable radios, too, so mm -hmm. if we ever had to. The problems we run into up in Florence, the lines actually go up to, uh, what street was it? I forget, but it, there's a vault up there in Florence. And every time we get a big storm or a lot of rain, it gets wet in there, and that's where we run into problems. So, you know, we call Verizon, they come out, 
um, you know, they, they fix it, but you know, we, we need to upgrade that system. And now when the city already has the fiber optic, it only makes sense to piggyback on that and get rid of that, mm -hmm. that cost. Mm -hmm. well, same with the light bulbs. It, it's crazy that we, we're, we're so far With the current system, I think this is the project <coughs> for them to date upon Yeah, this came through capital improvements yeah. under yeah. central service, so yeah. we've already, yeah. capital yeah. improvements has already heard just, just for information, you know, the current system, basically, we can't get parts for anymore. It's yeah. not supported software-wise. They don't even make it anymore. And uh, so, I mean, you know, the parts that we've needed in the past, we were lucky to find them in the back of somebody's repair vehicle, and, uh, you know, we would patch it together that way. So that's you know some of the problems why we started looking at moving forward, yeah. and uh, that's a big pro big project really. But I think some of the cool things coming out of it is uh, you know some of the energy efficient that we can do. Because uh, John's right, when the lights when we tone out apparatus, it's basically you, know, you wouldn't believe the amount of lights that go on and the draw that each of those fluorescent lights have. And uh, looking at the new system with the LED certainly would help reduce that cost out through there, and with the hope of reducing our, our replacement light bulb. Yeah, in the yeah. new system, we made sure to look at uh, a company that when you have to buy a, an LED light, it's not proprietary. So we can go, you know, if an LED light burns out, we go down to Foster's and get one. Those things last forever. Yeah, yeah. and we don't have to yeah. buy it from the company at $70 a piece. So that was one of the things we were looking at. And um, you were saying about the, um, what were you saying? About the, uh, the old system. The old system. Yeah. It's even the technicians. We use a company called Goose Town that fixes our radios and, and dispatch and stuff. And we've got to the point now where their technicians haven't been trained on our system. So they don't even when they come in to fix it, they actually one of our firefighters, Dennis Nazar, was our radio guy. He honestly probably knows more about that system than a lot of the technicians. So you know we end up bringing Dennis in have to work with the technicians to, to get parts and fix it. So, you know, before we get into trouble and lose the system completely, you know, we want to upgrade. And, and actually, the Jim Lake, I don't know if you remember what house, but he was here. He started the 911 center when we moved in there. He has since moved on to Charleston County, South Carolina. He's in charge of a large center down there, 33 fire stations. And uh, they just put installed this furnace system. And I spoke with him, and, and they love it. They came in on time under budget, and he said the people are great to work with. And we heard the same thing. We took a tour down to Boston Fire, and we spent the day down there talking to those folks, and, and they loved it. And the company's from where I have. So if we do have a problem, they're not in California or wherever. We can get somebody up here from Rhode Island to help us fix the system. So we're pretty excited about that. And then the final thing I wanted to bring up was uh, public education. As the chief said, we've, we've kind of gotten away from getting out into the schools and, and out with our seniors. And Firefighter Stolmeyer has, has come to us and she's literally, she's taken this thing uh, well beyond what we, we were hoping. And she's done a fantastic job, you know, she loves doing it. So we just had her put together a short little presentation of you know, kind of her goals. You know, we, we sat down and discussed you know, the chief where he wants to be. And we, you know, we haven't been in schools in a long time. Honestly, we, we got away from it. For whatever reason, but we need to get back into the schools, and we've got some stuff coming up with the seniors at the senior center. Uh, so we're, we're, we're excited about that. So I'm going to turn Great. it over to Firefighter Fulmer. I'm Natalie. I've been uh, with the department for about seven years, and a safe instructor for probably uh, four or five years. And um, I did a lot of things with that program. We did a lot of basic stuff, like our safety village in the summer, and a little a couple kindergarten classes here and there, and some tours. And a year ago, I took the educator class through the fire academy that's a 40-hour class. And it basically is a crash course on how to teach kids. Um, so I can't really call myself a teacher. I wouldn't ever do that because that's kind of a profession that I, I, I respect more than to be able to call myself a, a teacher. I like to say educator, but in a sense, it, give us, it gives it, me a kind of like an idea of what to expect when I'm putting programs together and teaching kids. Um, so right now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the SAFE program, what it is. Uh, safety and fire education, it, it's compromised by, it's comprised of two separate grants to equal about $7,000. Our senior SAFE grant is about $1,500 and that money goes towards strict programs for seniors so you can 
start to uh, teach things that have to do with obviously fire dangers, falls, um, hedges and smoking. Um, and that depends a lot on community partnerships. So like uh, uh, David said, we're going into the senior center in a couple weeks and um, that is one way that we're spending money by saying, hey, look, this is our winter preparedness for you guys. Like any of the seniors who attend the senior center events can stop by and talk to us about how to better prepare their home and themselves for that. Um, and then the school based safe is your standard safe education. Originally started back in 1997 in the state of Massachusetts, and I think we've been running at Northampton with the grant for, I think, 15 years. Um, I know Chief Nichols was originally a uh, safe instructor as well. Um, so this is your school age kids, anywhere from kindergarten or even pre-K to about 12th 12th uh, grade or your senior in high school. Um, and those are the same, uh, similar type of topics. You talk to them about fire safety, um, hazards of smoking is the biggest thing. Um, the state of Massachusetts, statistics wise, figures that most fires are due to um, smoking related incidents. So Kalish just holds a cigarette or the tools used for smoking, such as lighters and matches. So they really geared this whole grant towards what are you particularly going to do in your city, in your department, to teach about uh, hazardous smoking? So that's a big one that we kind of only touch on a little bit so far. So I'm looking to create um, a standard curriculum um, to go into the public schools with that. Um, and that, on the school-based side, school partnerships is a big thing that um, I'm looking to establish by the end of this year, I hope, and that um, basically means going to the school board, going to the administrators um, and superintendent saying, hey, this is what we can do for you. This is the time that we have to spend with you. Um, we'll pick either um, third grade or kindergarten to start off. Um, and this is, you know, we're, we're giving ourselves to them basically, like, please let us come in and um, help us fulfill this program because it's not happening right now. Um, so just to touch on a little bit of the history, like I already mentioned, um, basically it's grant funded. Um, originally the money was taken out of the cigarette tax, uh, and now it comes out of the Executive Office of Public Safety. Um, and the Department of Fire Service helps initiate that grant um, by training us as instructors and by creating a lot of the curriculum themselves and letting us use it. So it's a really good resource for us. Um, in Northampton, uh, We've started the Senior Safe Grant two years ago, um, and basically that was just going into the Senior Center. Um, maybe uh, this year we're planning on doing some CO and smoke detector installations and life safety inspections, which is a huge thing because we haven't, we've gotten away from going into um, senior homes and saying, this is who we are, the fire department, we're here to help you, and we'd like to help make it so your home is accident free. People should be safe where they live. Um, so that's a big goal for ours in this next coming year. Uh, what we did in the prior years, that includes that safety village, fire station open house, uh, those senior center vi visits, and any field days, like that Jackson Street has a field day at the end of every year. It's, um, we bring a spray house up and the kids squirt water. And um, in general, in my opinion, it lacks a message to kids. They have a lot of fun, they get to know us, and that in itself is a message, but um, and it's a fun activity, but in part, we're, we're missing the point on it. So, new goal for this year is to have that curriculum where anything we do with kids, whether it's a station tour or if it's a field day, it's going to have a specific message and a specific goal for our instructors to be given. Um, so right now, the program, uh, like uh, she said, um, I more or less volunteered for the spot. Um, and Captain Dave Moret is my co-partner. And overall, we're, we're overseen by Deputy Chief Anas, who was also a prior um, state program director in years past. <clears throat> so to me, uh, Northampton SAFE is a dedicated group of 18 educators. Uh, we recently posted a hiring for this position. Prior to three weeks ago, we only had six educators, and those were the same educators that I knew when I first started, um, and we never tried to bring anybody else in. So this year we posted it, said what the heck, like let, let's give it a shot, see if people are interested. And um, 
12 new people replied. They want to do it. They want to help out. They're eager to get out there and talk to the public. And um, I think there's room for them to do it. Um, 2,700 public students in Northampton, not counting your private schools like your Montessori's or Ethel Institutes, um, but 2,700 um, public students that we could potentially be reaching with 3,800 seniors residing in Northampton. Um, Northampton Safe is a role model, a resource, and a partner to residents, schools, clubs, businesses, and community organizations. Those are all the, the areas where we want to extend our hand and say, let's start this communication. Tell me what you want from the SAFE program in Northampton, and let's see if we can try and help you out with it. Um, our target, target on audience. Uh, it's all statistics based. Uh, in the state of Massachusetts, smoking and uh, smoking related materials are the number one cause of fires. In the nation as a whole, the National Fire Service stated that the cause is actually turned to cooking fires. Um, so what does that mean? Well, in Northampton, in the last couple years alone, we had one fire this past summer started by a young boy and his sister that um, got burned trying to cook. And a couple years ago, a fire in Meadowbrook started by a child who was playing with a lighter. So there you go. That's our audience right there. That's who we're, we're quote unquote going after. Like we need to reach out to these kids and get them in the schools where they're already in a learning environment, introduce ourselves as the not so scary firefighters, but the friendly community firefighters, and start teaching them that um, the acts that they're doing are unsafe or potentially unsafe. Um, so there's a lot of outreach that um, we need to be doing, that we will be doing in the next year. Um, how are you going to reach them? Like I touched on earlier, uh, establishing a whole new curriculum for the public schools. Um, not just saying, going into one kindergarten class and then saying, see you later, maybe next year when you're in first grade, I'll bump into you again, but saying, see you next month. I'm going to talk to you about um, stop, drop, and roll. See you a month after that. I'm going to talk to you about uh, staying low and crawling under smoke. So there's going to be a whole planned curriculum to reach out to these kids. And that is something that we don't do right now. Um, it's kind of like a one-hit wonder visit. Um, and we do reach some kids that way, but I think it could be a lot better. Um, so among that, Safety Village will always do that. It's our longest running program. Um, the other community events, like the July 4th celebration, we bring our um, Hazard House out if it doesn't rain. We bring Hazard House out, and uh, that's a great learning tool for kids. Um, all this uh, senior center trainings, um, the life safety inspections, and new for that program is going to be reaching out to home health aides and other senior community partners that we can train on life safety inspections and say, if you're going into an elderly person's residence um, as their health aide, you can also look around and help them to know what a trip hazard is help them to change their smoke alarm batteries, and so on and so forth. Um, all this is based on partnerships. I, I hate to make it sound like a business, but it kind of is. We have money to use in a more specific way than most years, so we need to make sure that it's put towards a good use. Um, those partnerships are coming from uh, Northampton Public Schools, the Senior Center, even the, the, police, the police department with their school resource officer, could be a great asset to both of our programs. Um, independent educators with the Hill Institute or uh, Montessori schools, for example, both of those places give me some really excellent feedback so far on my own instructor uh, capabilities. Um, in, uh, the, the, partner, the Department of Fire Services and their educational programs that they offer for any firefighters. Um, so that's it. We're striving to be the best safe program we can be. Um, in order to do that, however, we need to keep evaluating ourselves. Uh, we're, this year, new for the program also, we're going to be asking ourselves, how are we doing? How can we do better? And is this actually working? Um, none of these were uh, organized and asked in prior years. And I think when we do this and when we say this is what we want to become and set that goal for ourselves, um, we can only get better. So. I'm telling my instructors, my fellow instructors, I'm telling my teachers, and we're also evaluate, evaluating the kids to make sure what we're teaching them is getting through to them. So in the end, my hope is that everyone will be approving on themselves 
and of course the community as a whole will benefit from a great SAFE program. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. What age is the mess? I mean, at what age are they old enough to well, like really listen and young enough yeah, to really so that pay depends. attention? Like, you gotta be, the, the older high school kids like, yeah, yeah, yeah I don't even hear about it. And what's, right. there's gotta be a sweet spot in there at some point yeah, where so you're there's, interested in There's listening. curriculum for every grade level. Mm -hmm. um, there will be more curriculum for certain levels and instructors as independent people will want to teach a different grade level to pace depending on who they are. Um, Statistics-wise, coming from no, no Fire, it's a juvenile fire setting prevention program that, um, that's out there, it says that a kid age between, uh, I think it was 11 and, uh, 8 and 11, has the highest risk of starting fires. So right then and there, we can say, okay, let's target those ages between 8 and 11. Um, as far as actual listening capabilities, um, you need to be specific to who you're talking to. So obviously each child in their age group has a different way of learning. Um, I find that they might find it easiest to teach to a kindergarten class, but you might only find them really learning something when they get to third grade. But that doesn't mean we can discount anything below them. They need to know who firefighters are. They need to know that we're not scary when we have all of our gear on. We need to know that we mean that we're safe. And the basics of it. Because, I mean, thank goodness, you know, growing up, we had more structure fires than, you know, when many of those got out of here, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, kids 25, 30 years ago yeah. had more knowledge of, you know, they had friends whose houses burned out. You know, they, yeah. now, I mean, thank goodness we don't have the fires, so these kids don't really have first hand knowledge. Yeah, the fires are different. They are less, and they're also different, you know. Um, if kids are still the same in the sense that you're going to have the ones that like to mess around and pull the pull stations, mm -hmm. and then you're going to have the ones that like to hide and not exit their apartment building while the alarm is sounding. So fires today that might be contained to one apartment because of how efficient that building is, you might have kids not exiting their second or third floor apartments above them because they think it's a joke. So there's a lot of different areas you can reach out to these kids, and in the end, Personally, what I'm searching for is for that moment where we have a scenario where a kid or a child was involved, and they say, I learned this at school. They said um, to get out of the house. They said to have a meeting place. So this is why I did it. And they say themselves and their family. Um, there are incidents like that that do happen across the state and the nation. And it's only you know, a matter of implementing a few things here and there to kind of make sure we reach out to um, the biggest population we can. So, in a nutshell, safe program. Awesome. Well, thank you, Natalie. You're welcome. Yeah, I think it's just one of the initiatives is that, as I took the job that, you know, we do get a, a, a grant that's about $7,000 from the state every year and, and kind of challenge, I think, my people of how can we better utilize it? And um, pleasantly surprised and pleased that We've had, a, uh, as Natalie stated, a number of people, I think like 12 additional people that are interested in helping out and getting the word out. Uh, from kind of our standpoint, from the fire side, is, is prevention is the best method. Uh, if we can prevent the fire, it's better than trying to put it out. And uh, the goal is to try to get out into the community and you know, provide some education out there and you know, hopefully do some good things and give some kids. And you know, we're also looking to target some seniors some information that hopefully will make them safe and keep them well out there. Because um, I don't want to go to a structure fire, uh, I'm not prevented. And uh, you know, to the elderly is if we can give them information on how to be safe in your home. And uh, you know, information as far as trip hazards and things, and keep them in their home as long as you can. That, that's a great goal I think we should all strive for. And that we're looking to do. So uh, like I say, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm real pleased for the department that the amount of people that are really uh, you know, want to participate and help out with it. So it, it's kind of neat to have that enthusiasm as we go forward. Well, especially with the kids, you know, you, you don't want them to be in that environment. But when they are, you want them not to panic and to do the right thing and yeah. to exit the building mm -hmm. and yeah. kind of figure out if, it, you know, is everybody out? So they can, yeah. when you guys are out, they can report to you and say, hey, yeah. grandma's missing or, yeah. you 
know, that kind of thing. Exactly. So you can act on, exactly. yeah. on good information. Yeah, so I, I think we, we got at least some, some good groundwork moving and then we're hoping that we can continue that and, and get out into the community and uh, present that open up. Yeah, I think the interest in our department is probably a lot to do with Natalie. And, mm -hmm. You know, she's, they know it's going to be organized and, and there's going to be a plan. She hit on that as we were kind of this one hit wonder where we come in and overwhelm the kids with the trucks and all the cool gear and stuff. And I think she has an actual plan of, yeah, that's fun. But let's, follow up, let's like follow see up in two years, something. see in two years. Yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, that's the reason that our other firefighters want to get involved. They know it's going to be organized, it's going to be run well, and, you know, they're, they're going to make a difference and not just show up and bring the truck out and let us spray some water and clean the hall. So, yeah. I guess it's a testament to, to these folks. Yeah, I mean, the cool thing is, you know, we, it's, as Natalie says, we get the message out. I think that's kind of the, the mantra moving forward. Is let's get the information out there, and I think we can do, I know we can do some good stuff. Uh, maybe you could do some recruiting, too, you know. Like get a kid who wants to grow up going to fire service. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we would love to. Well, it happens, you know. Yeah. yeah, they find it interesting. And yeah, we actually have a meeting tomorrow with the high school for internships and yeah. stuff like that. So. Yeah. I mean, we, we've done well in the past, but I, I think it's, I'm excited that, you know, we've got a great group. Natalie's kind of leading the charge that I think we can do more. And, uh, and we've heard rumors that Smith Volk is going to maybe run an EMT program mm -hmm. to get kids certified as EMTs, mm -hmm. which for us would be. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great for them, too, because a lot of those kids are Hilltown kids. Yeah. And it's, you know, response time up there is slower. So mm -hmm. having more people up there with medical skills to be first responders and get people stable before they get transported. Yeah, and we that's can grab a couple of those kids and kind of get them interested. Mm -hmm. the, the, that's one area where the medical thing has really helped you guys out because you get a, a, a more well-rounded person interested in fire service because they got more to do, more to learn. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's interesting, I did, I, Jody and I actually met with the uh, president of Greenfield Community College, you know, because we're both alumni, mm -hmm. but then talking about how they could better their program aspect was in their paramedic program, they, after talking to them was, you know, kids come in the door and they're looking, all right, I want to be a paramedic, and, and then they try to give them some career direction, and it's like, well, you know, I want to be a, a firefighter paramedic, but they don't have any background in it, and, you know, for whatever reason, they, they can't get in a volunteer department and things like that, so they're, they're like, how do we, how do we kind of at least give them that, is this something that they're interested in, and they're really interested about putting a component into their paramedic program, where we actually would put them in turnout gear and an SCBA and use some simulated smoke and you know give them some tasks to do and say this is this really what you want to do so they were really interested and I know Joey had on the police side some real good initiatives to you know give them some information to say is this what you want to really do and the direction you want to go uh, so it's kind of neat that I think we got some some neat interesting hopefully partnerships that we're going to and it's nice too that both for you and Joey mm -hmm. you know their students can can see that the yeah. alumni from that program yeah. actually not only became involved in each field, but actually are running departments. Yeah. You know, that this is real education, it's valuable, it yeah. could lead to a job and a really good career. Yeah. If you follow through. Yeah, yeah. and that, that was, they, they were big on that. I kind of, I, I didn't see it, but as they explained to me up there, that was. Well, yeah, the kids are gonna say, hey, you know, yeah. this isn't just theoretical. Yeah. You know, these guys started here. and. So I kind of joked with him. I said, if you put Jody and I on the billboard on 91, I'd see him pass along. What happened? <laughs> I said, no, I'm only kidding about that. So, <laughs> so, so moving on there, uh, I'll have uh, Deputy Gary uh, give a quick EMS update. Uh, he's, he, as he came into the office, where Chris Norris uh, elected to go back out on the ship. So with, with seniority, he was able to do that. So he's actually a uh, shift deputy chief for us right now. Okay. And uh, you know, John passed the promotional test and topped it. And uh, he's <coughs> always been involved in EMS and was a great choice for us to bring in mm -hmm. and uh, overtake the program. And just a few things that we can kind of update you on where we are. Yep. So uh, came into this. I guess at a, a different point, um, we'll go over the statistics in a minute here, I have for you, but so uh, one of the first things that happened when I came in was the request for proposal for a new billing company. And that was actually the middle of my first week of orientation. Well, we use Coastal Medical Billing right now. And the RFPs came in and this Comstar company does billing, very reputable company, we checked them out. 
was uh, originally coastal was 3%, they came at 2.95. So based on um, you know, procurement laws and everything else, we had to change that. So um, sounds easy, but not at all. <laughs> so I really spent up until last week, uh, it took me about four weeks of Medicare, everybody's got a different number, all the insurance company, it, it's, it's, I want to say it's been a nightmare, but it's been a nightmare. So, there was a couple of days where I actually said to the chief, well, if you were the chief right now, I said I'd be going nuts because he's a great, he supports me 100% there, which is exciting. So the good news is when we go over statistics, I'll show you on the back page, and you're probably looking at it right now where our month of October has died. Um, we, the mayor's aware of it, um, and what's gonna happen is because of we stopped billing with comps, uh, coastal medical billing October 1st, we, I just recently in the last, today and last week, really started pumping out the bill. So we had 265 calls that had built up that hadn't gone anywhere in three weeks. They are now being submitted and they're all for billing. So if you pay attention to our billing logs and everything, they're gonna dip down for a couple months. The good news is it's this time in the year, we'll have time to recover, get the money back in before the end of the fiscal year, and at the end of the year, you sh you sh you'll see a dip in revenue, but it'll equal out at the end. So that's the plan. So that's the good news, and everybody's been very, uh, made aware of that, Susan Wright, everybody, so, and everybody's on board with that, so. So John had, John had quite the task, and as he says, it, it seems easy to switch a billing company, but where we deal with so many insurance companies, and you know, we have ID numbers, and they have ID numbers, we had to get all that information transferred over to the new company, Comstar, and, and then go through basically the contract and make sure we secured everything up and out, so. So in his, in his first month, I, I commend him, he did a great job uh, kind of pulling all that together. And uh, yeah, one of the, the side notes on that, as John mentioned, the, the revenue would drop just because we gotta get everything transitioned over. But uh, what we're told is by January 1st, we should start seeing uh, that rise up again as a peak as we catch up and then it should double off and be there uh, working pretty good. We did check a whole bunch of references with Comstar coming in. Uh, they're probably the second most paying company in the state. And uh, I checked with a number of fire trucks out there, we use them, and everybody had good things to say about them. So I think, you know, going out to bid and stuff, you know, we, they came in, you know, 0.05% less, but, you know, it's still a value to the city that will bring in a little extra revenue with that aspect of it. So, so John, I, I say thank him for uh, you know, getting all done, but as I tell him, he's got it under his belt now, so he's, it's old news and easy, easy habit set now as we go. So not, not being one thing by itself, the other thing that happened is uh, we got a state analyst inspection. So again, two weeks into the job, I had the, the ambulance inspector actually showed up while I was out one day and uh, I think spoke with Dick Nichols or somebody and said, hey, can you give him a break? He's only been here two weeks. Can you, can you make an appointment? We'll come on next week. So Phil Bonahue, who I've known for years, uh, I've been involved in EMS since the beginning. So originally when we licensed the ambulance, I dealt with him. So he knew me and, and uh, we made a, we pushed it off a week uh, and he came in and we passed. And I, I'm not taking the credit at all for that. I'll, the crews uh, out there, um, Assistant Chief Davin sent an email out to everybody on shift, explaining the predicament where I was in with the, the billing and um, asked everybody to pitch in and the, from the firefighters to the officers and everybody, they, each buddy, everybody took an ambulance and each crew stepped up and I didn't have to touch a single ambulance out there. So I want to first off thank them publicly and I thank them myself plenty of times because they, they really saved my butt with everything else I was doing. So all I had to concentrate on was the administrative side of the inspection where they come in and they check uh, training records. And so we were able to pull it off in a very short time. I had about a week's notice and uh, it was excellent. And uh, like I said, I'm not taking credit off for that. That was the crew's up and did a great, great job. So uh, that being said, I will, you have our, our, what we call our dashboard is our statistics that we run. Uh, and there's a big one on the back. As you can see, the uh, monthly trending, how October took a dive on that la uh, lower right hand corner. So that'll just give you an idea um, what we we expected that and that's what it did come true. Um, upper left hand corner, an overview of our calls. Um, it's surprising that we're 51% uh, advanced life support and 49% uh, uh, basic life support. Normally in most departments that's a lot higher. Um, however, we kind of notice a, uh, an upswing in um, our crisis style calls either be, um, you know, people still call it section 12 is in the letter of the law, but that's our crisis clause. That's people with having issues. So it seems we've, we've had a, an upswing in that by when I was checking all the numbers out. Um, and 
we're said to be doing that. And those people, you know, you 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 get with them, you make sure they're not going to hurt themselves or others. You know, and these aren't the people you're going to be sticking IVs into them if they don't need them and things like that. So those calls don't usually end up at the advanced life support level with cardiac monitors on and stuff. This is somebody who's just having a really bad day and needs somebody there to pretty much hold their hand and take them to the hospital and hand them off to the next level. So we've been doing a lot of those. So that's why you'll see that the uh, the call swing is about is almost 50-50, where normally you expect to see about 60-40. So we've noticed a, a large change in that. Um, and that's given our population. That's our population, and I think our population has, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and, and frequent flyer miles for some Yeah, and I think the mental health population, because we've had some expanse in that, you know, with uh, <clears throat> clinical support options and different groups that have come in here recently, we've seen a, a growth of that. So, you know, I was trying to crunch some numbers, uh, you know, this and the other day when I was looking at that, and it, it seems like we're doing more of those calls, and, um, and I think it's because there has been a growth of that industry. You know, there's certainly a need for it. There's no doubt about it. There's a lot of people that need help, you know, and uh, it's, it's absolutely a disease and they definitely need the, the treatment. So that's, you know. Does the call come from the individual or from an agency that's a lot of it's, 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 we never actually break it down that far. I can tell you a lot, we, it's probably pretty equal across the board between the public calling in saying there's a man down on the sidewalk, uh, the police department calling us and saying they have a, a crisis. A lot, of, a lot of the calls is a 911 call depending on who it's from, but we're meeting uh, police, we're staging, letting the police go in because we don't have the ability to make the scene safe like they do. We don't wear the body armor, don't have the, you know, the ability to do that. So they will make the scene, make sure everything's safe for us to enter, then our crews that are staged will enter in and, and then we can take over from there with the police stuff. We're a very good team, by the way, the police department and fire department, you know, we've only been on since 2015 years. Uh, I've never seen us get along with the fantastic right now so it's great I mean so it's nice we're working as a giant team out there um, a couple things I did want to uh, first page lower right hand corner um, it, it's called ETPS uh, it's our endotracheal intubations where we put the breathing tube in this is a huge statistic for us because this is a skill they've been talking about paramedics can't do with any kind of you know we say oh it's a, a physician has to do this you know medics miss all thing. We, we only we did eight cardiac arrests uh, so far uh, this month, and uh, every one of them has been a perfect tube. So we're doing really well on that. And then our IV success rate, again, is we're at 74%. We're above the national average. So our our folks that are doing these skills out there, I mean, I'm, I always say they're the best, but I got the numbers on to prove it. These people are fantastic. And uh, you know, I want anyone to take care of me and my family. So and it's nice to be able to pull these statistics up and, sh and show that. Well, you know, Physicians have a hard time with those. When yeah, it. I mean, it's not. It's a technique. And it is a technique. You don't do it all the time. Right. You're not real good at it. And our, I mean, our people, 100% right. We haven't missed one yet. So we're uh, this. So we're doing very well. I'm very proud of them. Um, so our statistics look great. Uh, a couple things a little lower than I thought. Like you said, the the BLS to ALS, but that's just mm -hmm. our clientele. But the skills that we are performing on the advanced life support level are, are right there. Are actually above national averages. So we're doing really well there. And our on scene times are looking really good. So uh, overall, the uh, service is running good. Um, I'm not taking credit for it. I'm telling you, it's the people who do the work every day, you know? They're excellent. So. How's the overall call volume? Because there was, there's a, we used to have a three page dashboard thing that did I could call do that volume. Yeah. yeah. And also um, tracking, you know, so the seven days, time of day. Yeah. I remember Tuesday at one o'clock used to be a killer for some reason. And it moved to Wednesday now. Moved to Wednesday. <laughs> so I don't know actually gonna break it down that far again, but it did move to Wednesdays at two o'clock. It was at two o'clock. Yeah, so now it's moved to Wednesday, which you would think is crazy, well, right? Why would you yeah. do Friday? Everybody's at work, night? everybody's at work, you know. Yeah. Um, Wouldn't buy the out crashing into things or having heart attacks. I, I started working in Springfield and uh, the ambulance is down there and everybody used to, you know, pick up Friday nights and Saturday nights and I think that would be the busiest. And it was busy for a certain call, the, the, the intoxicated young male under 30 uh, was that call. But the um, the cardiac arrest or anything? No. They were actually, the, during the daytime when people were more active and that's when you get that call. Or the other, and I can say the other one is where, you know, grandma or grandpa wakes up and, and you know, the person that did it, we'll get that, they get that six o'clock call, you know. We still get a lot of that still too. Um, so in, Hey, well, I, you know, that's the way to go in your sleep at night. So hey, you know, it's not so bad, right? So, but yeah. Um, but other than that, it, 
you when you see the so like I said, you're saying Tuesday around Wednesday, it's like in the middle of the day, the middle of the day. Wednesday. Yeah. What gives and you that? It's not just a little bit, it's a spike. It, yes. You know, and, and you look at that, I could have printed that one for now. I printed that, I'm like, holy cow, why would you think that? You know, but yeah, that was that third page. So but other than that, everything very good. Uh, like I said, you got the best people working for you down here, so mm -hmm. you know, makes it's my I think one of the, the cool things is when uh, Joey and I were up to read the community and we were talking about, you know, just the EMS response in the city. Uh, I would beg to ask, is there any other community that gets the response uh, that you would get in Northampton? Uh, I mean, you think about it, you got patrol officers on patrol that are carrying AEDs and, you know, no CPR, first aid. Uh, we got ambulances, you know, Florence, downtown. And depending on the level of call and the type of call, you could get an ambulance uh, and an engine crew to help you out there. I know with CPR right now, what they're teaching it is basically it's a team approach. Uh, basically, you need a group of people, and I think the number is like six. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, to be able to effectively really handle a cardiac arrest. And we're putting those people on scene, uh, you know, under five minutes. Mm -hmm. We'll get someone to their side, usually within two to three minutes. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the rest of the crew there, right after that. So. But for that and stroke, yeah. yeah, survivability increases tremendously with response time. Yeah. You're there in a couple of minutes. I think, I think good a, a cool call that we had was uh, we had a, a lady hit. She was driving a motorcycle yeah, was on, up on uh, North King Street. Yeah. And she got hit through there. Basically, pretty much, I say, amputated the leg. Mm -hmm. But you had a police officer put a tourniquet on. We had three medics on scene starting uh, procedures on them and uh, interventions. And you and I ran the, the times. Uh, from when we loaded her to the time that we backed into base aid was 33 minutes. It was the time of 911 call. The base aid, 32 minutes. Two minute response, 11 minutes on scene. That's, you know, tourniquets, IVs, board, transport, transport. Uh, and that base aid, 32 minutes later in the, in the trauma center. And, and I just thought that was phenomenal. You know, it was, there, it was late afternoon, so we were hitting some traffic coming out and hitting some traffic on 91. Uh, but that individual, uh, was in a trauma center, you know, within 35 minutes, basically see, seeking the care that they yeah. need. So half the time in the golden hours, as they call it. Yeah. And again, that's a perfect example where uh, two sauces are on scene. They wear, they call it, it's called a, it's like a big elastic band. Mm -hmm. It's called a SWAT tourniquet, SWAT T. It's a it's, uh, stretch, wrap, and tuck type tourniquet. Mm -hmm. They pretty much carry it for their own if they got shot or something, mm -hmm. they can take it themselves. And this police officer, and I don't even know her name, she's so new in the department, so I apologize for that. Got on scene first, pulled out of her own breastplate out of her bulletproof vest, and had placed that on the patient prior to our arrival. Fantastic. It was still leaking a little bit, uh, and we threw our next to our tourniquet right on top, and sometimes it does take multiple tourniquets. And uh, tighten that up, and like I said, we were from the time we arrived on scene, jumping out of those vehicles, but she was down the road in Bay State. You know? you know, we're talking pain, tons of pain medication on board, two large four IVs, needles for fluid replacement, package board, and gone. Uh, it was 11 minutes. When you're doing the call, it felt like forever. I will tell you that because I was one of the ones right there diving in. And see, I was like, all right, we gotta hurry, we gotta hurry. And then after when we reviewed the check call, the time, check the times because dispatch has all our times. And so I was like, oh, that was, you know, as long as you know, it felt like time was slowing down, it was taking forever. 11 minutes. That that's pretty good. So I was, mm -hmm. I can't complain. So and um, she ended, unfortunately didn't lose a leg. There was nothing left of it, but uh, they even reattached. But uh, she, she did survive, and she's, you know, she'll be, you know, have a prosthetic walking around today because of these guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, and again, the same thing, police has a really young department now. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I don't think that, I don't think that is a bad thing because yeah. youth enthusiasm and stamina and mm -hmm. desire to go out to work and... That can go a long way. It goes a long, <laughs> long way. It goes a long yeah. way. A good chunk of them are actually EMT. <clears throat> um, oh, the police officers, right? Yeah, and under the new... Um, what the state did is change all our cards last year mm -hmm. to make us national registry. You have to affiliate with somebody. Well, you have to affiliate with an ambulance service. So in order for them to maintain their EMTs, they're actually affiliated with us. I, over, I oversee all their EMS training, make sure that they're okay. getting in. So oh, to keep their EMT. Yeah, and, and, and uh, it, it's been great. They, you know, they pretty much put their own stuff in and I have to authorize it at the end when they go to renew. But it, again, it's, it's that next level where, you know, I remember coming in 2000, getting, and I they put an EMT patch on my shirt. I was one of the first ones to ever do it. Love the story because I did. And I got screamed at. What are you doing with that? I, you know, some old guys just back then they didn't want the ADs on the trucks. And uh, I think to myself, boy, some of those guys could see this department today, their heads would snap off, you know? And, and it, it really is. It's, it's come a long way. 
right? It's what the fire service is really about nowadays. It's you know it's a good chunk of our all volume and it's the right thing to do. You know? I mean, when structure fire is going down, yeah, yeah. And, and that's a good thing. I mean, you still yeah. got to be there to deal with it, yeah. but on a daily basis. Yeah. And it gets you out in the community, you interface with more people. Absolutely. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's kind of neat, you know, where we adopted that role. We, we really are personnel cross-trained, you know, fire suppression, EMS, you know, kind of a great value for the community. And, and I think I'm very proud of what we do. We have a great service out there. Uh, very proud of what, what everyone does. And, and I know we're particularly happy how well you guys and, and, and police are getting together now. Yeah. That isn't always the case in some cities, but yeah. it's nice that, because uh, you're always on scenes together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of neat. It's a good thing. I know with Chief Casper uh, and I, we try to, you know, been, been helping each other out, kind of new chiefs out there, mm -hmm. and have been bouncing things off each other, and certainly trying to work collaboratively going forward, uh, you know, to kind of keep the departments kind of connected and, you know, making sure we're, you know, progressing and going forward, mm -hmm. uh, trying to help everybody. I mean, one thing that makes this city stand out in the valley is that we're safe. Yeah. You know, people are safe on the streets, thanks to the police department. People are safe if something happens, thanks to you guys for ambulance response. And I think that's unique as you come up the valley. When you get here, you know, the public is, is safe in Northampton. Yeah. Can't, that's number one quality of life issue. Are we safe? Yeah, absolutely. In this day and age, that's huge. Mm -hmm. so that's that's all we have. Any other questions? No, I've been sort of freelance. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's well, I guess if that's it, we're gonna uh, let's see. We are dispensing with the approval of the minutes since there are only two of us here and no quorum. So I guess I'll ask if there's a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. 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 Aye. Yeah. Aye. Got it.